Well, thank you very much, Tim, and, and thank you for the opportunity to come and talk here today. Um, I wanted to give a, a very quick overview of WHICH's approach to this issue. And for those who aren't so familiar with WHICH, as Tim said, we are an independent consumer organisation. We're funded solely through the money that comes in from, from the um, magazines and other types of consumer information that we provide. And that funds the campaigning work that we do on behalf of all consumers. So food has always been one of our priorities. And at the moment, energy, personal finance and public services are also our campaigning priorities. So I wanted to give an overview of our approach to this issue, some of the research that we've done around consumer attitudes and priorities, where we are now and what we think needs to happen. So in terms of sustainability, I mean, as several people have already said, there's many elements to sustainability. And over the years, which has looked at many different aspects of them, from enabling people to make healthier choices, lots of work on food safety, which we've been picking up again more recently with all the issues around Campylobacter and chicken, food fraud, prices, misleading special offers, quality of food products. So looked at a whole range of different aspects of sustainability. And then in more recent years have also looked to, to a certain extent to how we can bring these issues together in a meaningful and coherent way and also take into account some of the broader global challenges that are going to be impacting on consumers now as well as um, in the years to come. Um, so I suppose... The, the way that we approach it can be summarised as, as looking at consumer choice in a much more fundamental way in terms of what type of food system or food supply chain do people ultimately want in the longer term. So at the end of 2012, we did a series of citizens' juries where we presented many of the different things that were going to be facing the food system and had lots of experts giving evidence as part of that and then got people to consider the issues and think about the different options for how we move forward and how they saw the different responsibilities, both for themselves, but also for the industry and for government. So that looked at mainly at issues around diet and health, around environmental impact of food, around, around the reason for food price rises, because they've been particularly rising around that time, and wider issues around food security and future food production methods. So we carried out juries um, in each of the four countries. Um, the key themes to emerge, as some of you will have already heard, because I've, I've spoken about this quite a few times, is that I think it was really interesting the journey that people went through, because when people arrived in these workshops where they really hadn't got much of a clue what they were going to be talking about, um, they, they kind of knew a bit about healthier eating, possibly. They were very motivated by price, um, but generally didn't really think about food production or think about the environmental impact of food. But when we actually explained it to them, they became really engaged and really interested and quite shocked that there were all these big challenges and potential issues that would be affecting the choice of foods they had in the long term that they, they hadn't really been told about or asked to consider. Um, so for some people, um, they, they really felt that as a result of what they'd heard, they would be thinking differently about the types of food choices that they would be making, but recognised that it was something that was quite difficult to do when price was such a dominant factor and many people were being affected by the rising food prices but also had less income to spend on food. Um, they thought that there was a clear role for government and they thought that government needed to be informing people and recognised that not everybody could be kind of put through the process that they'd been put through for two days to get this kind of intense, um, you know, up-to-date information, but there needed to be much wider information about this. We asked them about the kind of action that they wanted from government, and as you know, lots of people are saying here, it's pretty obvious, they thought that the government needed to take a lead and have a plan. And they thought there needed to be much more co coordination and investment in research, but that, that needed to be really transparent. Kind of, some were a bit more open to innovation than others, but real clear message that it had to be in the public good and that um, you had to have strong independent oversight about it. They wanted much clearer information, um, but they also wanted the government to be supporting other types of initiatives like Grow Your Own voucher schemes as well to help them put some of the advice into practice. For retailers, there were a range of actions which included also giving people clearer information, looking at the pricing, the way they supported suppliers, reducing waste, and thinking about the, the pricing practices and the types of special offers that they had and the types of foods that they put those on. Um, so that's kind of the work that we've been doing around the more fundamental aspect, I suppose, of choice in terms of do you actually have any choice in, in how our food system is going forward. But then looking at it at a much more basic level, we've also carried out research looking at the type of information that would be most meaningful for people in terms of the information that they should have on the label. And we did this research about three or four years ago, 
And I think there was a lot more focus on this at the time, particularly at European level. There was a lot of talk about potentially coming out with some kind of different eco-label schemes, that were not, well, not just the eco-label, but looking at other types of ways that this sort of information could be communicated to consumers. So the research that we did showed that people generally weren't that aware of the existing environmental schemes that were on the market, other than the fair trade label, which really stood out for people. And people wanted something simple, clear, easy to spot, um, but, but it had to be independent and it had to be um, based on clear criteria and evidence. Other research that we've done, um, sort of more straightforward magazine articles as well, is explaining to people issues like the different fish labelling schemes on the market, which people are always really interested in because they always find it quite difficult to understand what they mean. I thought it would be useful to show you. Um, this is a couple of years out of date, but we're hoping to do something similar <coughs> again. But what was quite surprising when we did look at the different environmental and ethical labelling schemes that were out there, that, as you can see, fair trade just it dominates in terms of people's awareness and the, the, the extent to which they understand it. But a lot of the other schemes that you would think people would be more familiar with because they've been around for a while, even things like Marine Stewardship Council, Freedom Food, there was relatively low awareness of it. And at the time, the Carbon Trust footprint label was being used by Tesco, but obviously they've stopped doing that now. So I've talked a bit more about the kind of deliberative research that we did. Um, we also do quite regular survey work asking people about what their priorities are when they're choosing foods. And I think that's quite interesting in that people's knee-jerk reaction is, as you would expect, that price is the main consideration overall. Um, that it's about value for money, it's about taste, quality and price. And I think it's still encouraging that things like environmental impact of food, fair trade, locally produced, buying in season, matter to over 50% of people. But increasingly, when we ask people about it, price is the, is the issue that they say is, is, um, makes most, that, that is affecting their choices the most. And as you can see, when we asked about um, what dominates their decisions overall, it was price, quality, and then taste. And we're about to do this survey again. We'll do this again at the beginning of next year and also ask more um, in-depth questions about um, what is influencing people's choices. So that's an overview of some of the research that we've done. And in terms of where are we now, I thought it was useful to look at this, although several people have already covered it to a large extent, but the research that we've shown, you, we obviously need to have a much more coherent and joined up approach to food policy that brings all these different elements together. Um, and although a few years ago we did have the Food, 20, food 2030 strategy, um, we don't have a strategy anymore. Um, and at EU level, as several people have said, Things were looking pr quite promising with the EU communication on sustainable food. And we were optimistically thinking maybe it won't all be about the common agricultural policy. Maybe we will have an opportunity to have a food policy. But that has just been really shrunk. And if anything, the only initiatives that will come out of it seem to be focused on food waste, which is important, but obviously is just one element of it. At national level, we don't have the food strategy. And we were part of the Green Food Project that DEFRA set up which was the coalition government's initiative to try and have some kind of plan. But that was really about economic development with environment added on and not really much else. There was a second part, as Sue mentioned, which is looking at the consumption side, which developed um, eight principles for sustainable diets. But that has, still hasn't been published and doesn't have any official status. So the Green Food Project was quite limited and just basically seems to have come to an end anyway. So the only thing we really have as a government food policy at the moment is the agricultural technology strategy, which is all about um, sustainable intensification, but very much from a, the industrial strategy, economic development perspective. And completely separately, over in the health department, we have the responsibility deal, which has a pledge around increasing fruit and vegetable consumption, but isn't in any way joined up um, with the other part of government. As a result of food fraud, we've now got this um, food safety and food crime committee that the um, food minister is going to be chairing. And we asked when the Elliott report recommended that, that it could be broadened out and be some kind of committee like the previous sub, um, cabinet subcommittee that we had that could bring these issues together, but it's still very narrowly focused. And as I said, in terms of progress on sustainable diets, the principles don't have any formal status. And it seems that, if anything, some of the industry initiatives and the EU initiatives around labelling have also all been stored now. So where does that leave us? Well, which has published a manifesto for the next government and food is a key part of that. So in that, we've set out clearly that we think that consumers need to involve in developing a national strategy, sorry, a national strategy 
for the future of our food production, ensuring that consumer views and interests are central to decision making, including when new technologies and techniques may be introduced. But also an important aspect is making sure that we have strong, independent national food standards agencies that are real consumer champions. And that's in the plural, because as you'll know, on Tuesday, the <coughs> Food Scotland Bill was adopted, which means that we'll have a new Food Standards Scotland in operation from April. So there'll be, that's got a much broader remit than the Food Standards Agency in England, so there's different opportunities there for it to take these things forward. And finally, I just wanted to mention that we're in the process of doing some more deliberative workshops, trying to take them to the next level that we, from what we did before, um, trying to set out again the challenges facing the food system and understand what people think are some of the options moving forward. This time we're doing it in partnership with the Government Office of Science, so we're putting in half the funding, they're putting in half, and then when it's coming through science-wise that does a lot of this um, research around science and policy. Um, and again, it will be discussing the challenges facing the food system and possible ways forward and different <coughs> roles and responsibilities. And there's going to be three two-day workshops which will be reconvened. So people come one Saturday and then they'll come the following Saturday. They'll heal a balance of different perspectives and evidence and they'll be taking place from the end of January and then all through February. <coughs>